you see my wine barrel that I bought last year. Um, there was a reason for that. I wanted a visual. I wanted just something to represent an encounter that I had in 2015, which would be eight years ago when we went to Nashville to uh, what's it, Voice of the Apostles with uh, Randy Clark and his team and their annual uh, conference that they put on the apostolic and um, it was really a really good conference it was a really a life-changing time for all of us I got to see the manifestation of gold dust for the very first time in my life I mean it was it was real it's just still unbelievable to the natural mind um, but I saw that with my own eyes not just for quite a while I watched the gold just manifest in this Bible. They'd dump it out and more would just show up. It was pretty amazing. I've got an envelope with some of it in there somewhere here. But it wasn't, it, it was just the miraculous and just seeing how awesome our God is. But uh, during that time, I had an encounter with the Lord. And I'm going to share that real quick. I've shared it many times. But I had this encounter during worship. Heidi Baker was the speaker for that morning it was a morning session, which morning, you know, has got even move in the mornings. <laughs> the people showed up. Everybody was there. It was really a good, a really good uh, intimate time. Had really good worship. Um, can't remember. Steve Swanson was the worship leader. I believe he was there. Um, but Heidi Baker was kind of leading the meeting and leading the worship time, which most speakers you know, don't really get involved in the worship part. But she was on the stage. She was involved from beginning to end, which I really like about her. And um, anyway, I was caught up in the spirit. And I had this vision. If you want to call it a vision, I call it more of an encounter with the Lord. And for the very first time, I was taken to the wine room of heaven, the room of wine in heaven. Never been to the wine room, never really heard much about it. Had experienced getting drunk in the Holy Ghost a few times, but this really opened things up to me, and it was really a powerful encounter, and, um, you know, God, God can show you the same, the same thing in different ways, and he shows it to different people in different ways, so we can't get so rigid to think, well, that's not the real wine rooms you went in, because it didn't look like what I saw, well, God's diverse. He can show a person any way he wants to. He will speak to you the way that you listen. That's what I found out, because he wants you to get the point. He wants us to mature and learn to listen the way that he speaks. But he has mercy and grace for us, and he speaks to us the way that we'll listen. And so this is the way that, you know, it, it spoke to me in a very powerful way. But I was ascending the mountain of the Lord in this encounter, and I saw this, it looked like a cellar door. On the side of the mountain, it was a beautiful, wooden, ancient door. And, you know, you just know things in the spirit. And it said, wine room on it, or the room of wine. And so, God was taking me into the, a new place that I hadn't been in the spirit. And um, I went in and I saw this room, this big room was dimly lit as far as light goes. And it had racks and racks and racks of wine bottles you know all sitting on their side and each one had a name had a label on the bottle and it was all the different moves of god that had taken place on planet earth from the very beginning to the ending um of what had happened up to to this point in history and you know it had the hebrides revival and the welsh revival and you know um the outpouring and um of the holy spirit azusa street revival uh, there was, you know, all up to the modern day revivals that we had experienced in the church up to that point. And the Lord or the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit was with me like a guide. And he said to me, you can drink from any of these moves of the Spirit at any time by faith. You can partake of what they partook of because it's been poured out. It's available. It's the bottles have been opened to us. And so, um... I thought that was pretty cool, but there was more to it. I saw 
toward the back right corner of this big room, I saw a, a, a room that was higher, that was brighter, had steps going up into it. And so I knew I was supposed to send up into this other room. And I knew this room represented what was to come, the future, starting from now and going forward. And so I went in and to this room, I went up into this, it was a smaller room, which tells me that we're at the end of time, not, you know, somewhere even in the middle because God's moved in so many ways for so long. And this thing is wrapping up. So this room was smaller. It represented the future and what God was going to do and is doing in the earth and on it, I saw racks, barrels, not bottles, but barrels, which tells me that what God is about to do is greater than anything that's been done up to this point. Um, I mean, it's just the way that God speaks to me. You know, a barrel is much larger than a bottle. So God moved in a special way and poured out his spirit and moved miraculously. But what we're going to see in the last days is greater than anything we've seen up to this point. Now, that's the understanding I was getting out of this encounter. And so I saw our barrel that had New Horizons on the front of it. It was a beautiful barrel. It had gold letters on it that said uh, New Horizons. And I knew that this was the wine that God had reserved, created for us right here to partake of in the coming days. And so, you know, that was the encounter. And so, uh, you know, so I went and bought this barrel. And that's about the size of the, in the vision of the barrel that I saw. I can't remember how big this barrel is. one of the bigger ones. But anyway, I just wanted something, you know, to connect with, to, to visualize kind of what I'm talking about. So this is an actual wine barrel. And as I was just sitting there and worshiping God in the, in the, in the spirit this morning, you know, I noticed these words, edge wild. But more than that, I noticed the tree. Now, I don't know what the you know, the brand of this wine or whatever it was, but this is what the Lord was speaking to me. This is heaven, this is earth. And this is the threshold, which is also called a transition. You know, you, you go from one room to another, you put down a threshold, or it's called a transition because you're moving from one place to another, just like that, the dimly lit room with the bottles. There was a transition place where I entered into something higher, something greater, into a different place. And so, <clears throat> this is heaven, this is earth, and I like the words edge wild because the transition will, <laughs> it is cutting edge what God is doing. I want to be on the cutting edge of what God is doing, and I want to be in that place to bring heaven to earth. That's what I believe the mandate on the church is. And so, you know, God is, the wine that God has reserved, and I'm going to talk about all this, I'm going to show you, in the, especially in the Old Testament, how important this is. God has a wine. And very simply. Very simply. Another way to look at this. Is that. Um, you remember the first miracle that Jesus did. Cana. The wedding. Cana of Galilee. He turned the water into wine. Well. Biblically. Water. Represents the word. The teachings. In Hebrew, that's what they'll tell you. Water means the teachings, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the, the rabbis, teachings of Moses all the way through. Water represents the word. And the wine represents the Holy Spirit. And so when you bring, just think about this. When you, we have the word and the word is good, but it's not until the Holy Spirit takes hold of the word that it becomes a reality in your life, in your heart. That's called revelation. The Holy Spirit has to illuminate the word, has to cause it to speak to you because it's living and it's active. But without the Holy Spirit, the truth is the word is just the word and it's dry. But when it's mixed with faith, with the Holy Spirit, the word is activated and becomes alive in you and me. The Holy Spirit performs the word. And these last days, what we're moving into is the fullness of the word and the fullness of the spirit. It's going to be the fullness of heaven being revealed in the earth. And right now we're at a transition. And 
it's going to take people that are willing to get outside of their box, that are willing to get beyond their self and move into something brand new that they've... It, it, one of the hardest things in the world is for people to unlearn things they've learned that were either wrong or for that day, but not for today. They, present truth doesn't destroy past truth. Past truth is the foundation upon which present truth is established. And so truth is always truth. The Holy Spirit is always the Holy Spirit. The Word is always the Word of God. But when the Spirit and the Word come together as one and begin to work as one, there's an explosion. There's a multiplication. There's the miraculous power of God on demonstration. Amen? That's the truth. So, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.13. He says, For whether we, are, we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Beside ourselves. If you, if you just look up that word in the Greek that was used there, exist to me. It means to throw out a position. Now, this is Paul saying, if I'm, if I'm beside myself, it's for him. It means to be amazed, to be astonished, in wonderment, to be out of one's mind, beside oneself. It even has the meaning of being insane. Because in the natural mind, what God does doesn't make sense. That's why people that are so logical and think logically struggle so hard to receiving from the Holy Spirit because it doesn't make sense to the natural mind the way that God operates this word means to stand out to become astounded or amazed astonished even I don't really like to use this but beside yourself or in wonder or bewitched now that you know that in our society that has a bad meaning to it but what paul is saying is i'm caught up in the spirit i'm not i'm not thinking with my natural mind i'm i'm entering and engaging with the mind of christ i'm in the spirit not just living by the spirit but i'm walking in the spirit i'm seeing i'm having visitations i'm having encounters i'm having visions god is speaking to me i'm I'm with him in spirit. I've been made one spirit with him. And I can fellowship with him. Not just by faith and what the word says. I can actually have encounters with him. And so that's what Paul is talking about. He says if I'm in my right mind. Then it's for your benefit. But if I'm beside myself. I'm with him. And basically you know. That's the time when leave me alone. Because I'm having, I'm having a good time with Jesus. Okay. So, um, I got a lot of scriptures. I need to get into them. I don't know exactly where to start, but um, let's start in, let's look at the book of Mark. I'll start in the New Testament. I wasn't going to, but I will. So, let's go to the book of Mark, 222. If you like twos, this is your scripture. This is where Jesus is giving all these different teachings or parables, um, Verse 20 says this, but, when the day, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. We know that happened. Jesus is the bridegroom. And then shall they fast in those days. Because, you know, the religious people were, you know, attacking the disciples. Say, well, they don't fast on the Sabbath. They don't do that. They don't keep the law. They don't do any of this stuff. You know, so, you know, how close can they be with God? No man also sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment. Else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. Okay, so it's talking about the old and the new. The old thing, the new thing. And no man puts new wine into an old bottle, or wine, old wine skin. Else the new wine does burst the bottles, and the wine spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new wine skins, or new bottles. So, what is, what is that parable talking about? Jesus is referring to wine. Why? Because the wine speaks of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if I don't go away, he can't come. Who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be poured out in a new way. 
And when he's poured out on the day of Pentecost, it's not going to be like when the Spirit was poured out at Passover. It's completely different. There's, there's something greater coming. It's like, you know, I look at Passover as the beginning, 30-fold salvation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, you know, as being baptized in the Holy Spirit, 60-fold. And then we go to perfection or into tabernacles, which is 100-fold, the fullness of the Spirit and the fullness of the Word in the fullness of time. So it speaks of the fullness and the fullness of His glory. So what Jesus is saying here is that the wineskin has to be renewed. In other words, you've got to have a different mindset. You've got to have a different heart set. You've got to have a different life set. You've got to be set in position to receive something new from the Lord. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to transition. To go from what you know now to what you don't know, but God wants you to know. That realm of the unknown, the realm called mysteries, the mysteries of the kingdom. And I love when God reveals the mysteries of the kingdom to us. It's called revelation. The Holy Spirit reveals. He unveils stuff that's in the word of God that's been there from the very beginning in plain sight, but we couldn't see it. But he unveils it. He uncovers it to take the top off, to pull the covers back so we can see deeper into what the Word is saying, what God is doing now. Because God is always moving. Okay, so we got to have the Word. we got to have the Spirit. We want the marriage of those two things working in our life. And so um, let's go to the book of John. Kind of out of order here, but that's okay. John chapter 2 is the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, Jesus hadn't performed any miracles yet. Jesus just told him that I'm, you know, I'm the Lamb of God, I'm the Savior of the world, I am the Son of God. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they waited, wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Why is that? Because there's a relationship in Jewish thinking between, you know, the son and the mother. There's a bond there that's special. That the son would do everything he can to make his mother happy. To make his mother glad. To fulfill his mother's wishes. That's what a good son does. Amen? It's true. We honor our mothers and fathers. And so they had run out of wine at the wedding. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother, basically, get this, ignores what he said to her. She doesn't pay any attention to what he just said. She said his mother said unto the servants, she, she hears him, here's what he says, and she turns to those that are with him and says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. <laughs> so she said, oh, you know, I know that you're going to honor me, son. I know that you're going to do what I've asked. Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone. So there was these stone or these clay pots. And there were six. Six is key in this, in this understanding of this parable. And the story of what. This actually wasn't a parable. This was actually an encounter. This is actually something in history that actually happened. But the number six is very important. After the manner of purifying of the Jews. So these pots were not made, they weren't there to hold wine. They were there as a ritual, as a religious purification ceremony. They would wash with the water, the washing of the water of these pots. And somehow they believed that that would sanctify them. Okay, just as with the natural water in these six pots. Number one, six represents man. Man was what? Created on the sixth day of creation in Genesis. But it's much more than that. There are also 6,000, there are six Alephs in the very first verse of the Bible, which an Aleph is equal to a thousand because uh, um, Hebrew is also a numeric language. So, you know, it's alphanumeric. And so it speaks of 6,000 years. So this creation is for 6,000 years. Those six stones, pots, represent the six. And, um, 
I don't know, I'm so far ahead of myself here. Okay, also, let me just throw this in. Because everything God does is for a purpose. So they say that these, these clay pots would hold between 20 to 30 gallons. I believe 20 gallons is, is better because it really goes with my teaching this morning. So I'm going to say 20 gallons in each one. So 6 times 20 is what? 120. How many people were represented in the upper room? 120. When what? The Holy Spirit, the wine was poured out. A new wine. The Spirit of God was poured out in a new way. So 120 gallons was, you know, representing the 120 that would be there on the day of Pentecost for the literal outpouring of the Holy Spirit from heaven, from heaven into the earth. A new thing, a new wine, a new move of the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, so let's read on here. The manner of purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And notice none of this took place until they ran out. And that's usually when God moves. When you've done all that you can do, you've stood as long as you can stand, and you have no way out. There's no way to escape. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He will answer your prayer not in the time that you want him to, but at the right time. And usually it's at the last minute. God moves. God shows up. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Usually in the Jewish setting, they would serve the best wine first, because that's when everybody, you know, is first tasting, and, you know, they want to honor the guests that have come, and that's the tradition is to give your best to them, give your best to God. But Jesus... This is part of the miracle. Because there's two types of wine. There's the new wine, which is non-fermented, which is the squeezing of the grapes. So it's basically grape juice. It's new wine. It's not had time to age or ferment. And there's the, the what they would consider the, the fine wine, or the best wine is the oldest wine. The wine, the wine that is aged. Fine wine takes time. I heard a prophet say that one time. Fine wine takes time. The older the wine, the better the wine. And so what Jesus did, Jesus created new wine, but what he actually created was ancient wine in a new time. He poured out something that had always been, but he brought it into the now. Are you with me? Can you see what he did? He brought the best wine for last. In other words, it's speaking of the end time move of the Holy Spirit is going to be the best time. We are living in the best time. God is going to do greater things in our time than he's even done before. Because of the time that we're in. And he saved the best wine. He saved the most ancient wine. The wine that has been reserved for this time. For now. And he's going to pour it out. And it's a greater. It has a greater power. Potency in it. Okay. So that was even more of the miracle. He just didn't create a new wine. He caused that wine to be fermented. He caused that wine to be aged. What does that speak of? Maturity. In scripture, wine represents maturity. Wine gets better with time. And so God is looking for a mature bride. We're at a wedding here. He's looking for a mature bride for his bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The body must grow up to the full stature of what? The head, Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, so verse 11 says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. So another purpose, the wine represents the glory of God. And his disciples believed on him. They saw and they believed, but now... God wants us to believe and see. 
Believing is seeing. And I'll t show you where wine is connected with spiritual eyesight. The opening of our spiritual eyes. There's a connection to being filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's, um, let me see, okay. A few more things I want to say. So this first miracle that Jesus did at Cana, the time is important. I'm talking a lot about time this morning too. This was the beginning of the new year. This was the month of Nisan. They were actually in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. This was the time of Passover. This is just a few days before the, the first feast that they celebrate on their biblical calendar. So, um, and how do you know that? Well, if you just read a little farther, it says that, you know, they, they come, they're there for, for verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And so, this is during the beginning of Nisan, right before the Feast of Passover. Jesus turns the water into wine. Wine also can represent blood because it's what? The blood of grapes. It is the blood of the grapes. Okay. So again, Jesus is giving them a prophetic picture of what's going on here because Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified, you know, at Passover, at the feast of Passover because he is the Passover lamb. They had lots of Passover lambs, but Jesus is not just a lamb. Jesus is the spotless perfect passover lamb that he's going to pour out his blood to wash away all sin for all time he was about to change time he was about to bring a transition he was about to bring a transformation he was about to bring heaven into the earth because that's who he was that's what he was he was the son that came from heaven okay and so this was his first miracle it spoke it, it Revealed the glory of God. It revealed who he was to his disciples. And now they believed in him. And they believed that he was the son of God. All right. Um, now let me go into the Old Testament. Let me just read some scriptures. Exodus. Well, I'll give some to you. For sake of time. Exodus chapter 7. If you read from 17 to 20. This is where they're going. Moses is going to Pharaoh. And telling him to let my people go. Doing what God said to do. And Pharaoh refused. So it says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And Moses took his staff. Moses and Aaron. And the same staff that swallowed up the snakes. Because the power of God is greater than any power of the enemy. Okay. He said I'm going to turn all the water in Egypt into what? Blood. Blood or wine. Wine represents blood. Blood represents wine. The blood of the grapes. So this is like a precursor. This is like a prophetic sign of what God, Jesus, was going to do on that cross. All the water was going to be turned into blood. Egypt was going to be covered in blood. Everything in the rivers were going to, in the Nile River was going to dry up and die. Because the Nile River was the source of life to them. Blood is our source of life. Amen. The life is in the blood. Okay, so Jesus cleansed the land with his blood. But what happened in the Old Testament, they were, they were, they were cursed. The blood killed everything. They couldn't drink the water anymore. They had to begin to try to dig new wells to find water. All of the water sources in Egypt turned into blood. This was the first plague. This was the first demonstration of God's glory in the earth. And what it's showing us is that Jesus and his blood was greater even than Moses and the blood that Moses manifested in Egypt. It was a picture, a foreshadow of what was to come. That there was going to be a land that was going to be covered in the blood again. But it wasn't going to bring death this time. But through Christ, because he's greater, it's going to bring life. Amen? Okay, so moving on. Let's read Genesis chapter 49. It's one you don't read all the time. Chapter 49 and um, verse 10 is, is the main scripture. Um, it says the scepter. This is a messianic prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. We know that Jesus through the lineage of Mary and Joseph 
even though Joseph wasn't his natural dad, God the Father is, wasn't his. But even through the, they were of the descendants of Judah. They were the royal kingship line. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foe unto the vine, that's talking about the vine, the grape vine, where wine is produced from, and his ass his coat unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine. This is a prophetic word, a messianic prophecy. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of the grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Okay, so that's a, a messianic promise that, that speaks of a new wine. He's going to wash his garment. What, a wine again is what? The Holy Spirit, the moving of the Spirit. Wine represents the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. Wine represents the messianic kingdom. So when the Bible talks about wine, we're talking about the coming kingdom. We're talking about something greater that's coming from heaven to earth. The messianic kingdom. Wine speaks of joy. It speaks of gladness. Wine speaks of fruitfulness and abundance. All these things are part of the kingdom. Okay, let's read another one. Let, well, let me just talk about this for a second. Okay, let's look at another prototype here. Noah. We know about the flood of Noah. And Noah's, you know, in the boat for all those days, 300 and whatever it was, total days. Okay, and it comes to, we believe now, rest on Mount Ararat now. And, but the first, what it says is that when Noah, when they stepped out of the boat, there was a sign of what? This is a new covenant. This is a new day for you, Noah. This is the eighth day. They step out. And the first thing that it says Noah did in uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, is he planted a vineyard. Why would he plant a vineyard? Because it's connected to a new covenant that God made with him. And he gave him right before that in the scripture. It says he created the bow, the rainbow. He gave Noah the rainbow. He gave the rainbow as a sign to his people that he was a covenant-keeping God. But if they kept their covenant, he would keep his covenant. This was an eternal covenant that he made. That's what the rainbow is a picture of. And the first thing Noah does then under the new covenant is he plants a vineyard. Because there needs to be the blood of grapes. There needs to be a new thing that God is doing. And God did. He created a new earth with Noah and through Noah and his family. Okay, let's read some more scriptures that have to do with speaking of the wine, the spiritual wine, the wine of the spirit, supernatural wine. Amos, these are scriptures you guys have all read at one point or another. Amos chapter 9, verse 11, 9 11. I think this is the right one. Yeah. It says. And that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Another messianic prophetic prophecy of the end times. And close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins. And I will build it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom. And of all the heathen. Which are called by my name. Saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold the days come. Saith the Lord. Speaking of the future again. That the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Okay. So we see prophetically in the last days, this sweet wine, this new wine, has to come. There is a new wine that God is going to pour out in the church, in the remnant first. And by faith, we can partake of that. And what it represents and what it is, is something greater. God is going to do greater in the last day than it did in the form because he keeps covenant with his people. And the blood of Jesus Christ ratified the new covenant. It's the new covenant in his blood. You can read in the book of Hebrews, it talks about what that transition looked like. The priesthood changed. Everything changed. People... Heaven was opened up, was no longer closed. The Holy Spirit was 
not just given to this one or that one, but was poured out upon all flesh. Anyone can receive. The wine represents the miraculous. Let's, let's, let's read another scripture. Micah. How long has it been since you read the book of Micah? Micah, how about a 44? You like fours? Multiples of two. Here we go. God likes fours. But they shall sit, Micah 4, 4. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. Again, speaking of grapevine. Grapes comes the wine. So we got the vine and the wine. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. How about that? Let's sit under the vine. Let's drink of the new wine. That's what that's speaking of. That's why Noah planted a vineyard. The outpouring, it was all pointing to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have, you know, we look back on now, but they were looking forward to it. But there's something greater. Pentecost and the outpouring of the initial spirit was not the end. That was only in the middle. There's something greater that God is doing now in the last days, in the end time. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3 verse 10. It says, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, the Messianic kingdom day, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. When Jew is thinking, if you're a man and you have a vineyard, you're a blessed man. If you have a fig tree, you're a blessed man. You can share the blessings that God has given you with others. See, this thing isn't about us four and no more. <laughs> it's about God doing a work in us so that he can work through you to do a work in others. Amen? You got a testimony, then you're powerful. Because you can share your testimony of what God did in your life, and that will speak to other people. That will open up their heart. Because they can say, hey, if God could do it to him, he can do it for me. God did it for me, he'll do it for you. Okay, a couple other scriptures. I think maybe, uh, I don't know if I shared this one or not yet. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 18. Let me write one. Oh, not three, five, sorry. 518. That was a good scripture, though. They all are. Mm -hmm. it says this, and be not drunk. Also, Paul, I believe, teaching the church. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. You know, everybody gets, uh, well, see, we can drink wine, but, you know, natural wine. That's not what, none of this is about natural wine. This is all supernatural. This is all spiritual. God is talking about what he's doing in the earth. What he's pouring out. The, how the Holy Spirit operates. Not some carnal man. Not by the natural mind. It says we're in his access. That word actually means like you did when you were unsaved. Don't be drunk with wine like you used to be is what he's saying. Stop drinking wine and getting drunk. Don't be like you used to be because now you're not. You're not that old creation. You're not that old creature. You're a new creation in Christ. So now, but be filled with the Spirit. Drink the new wine. Be full of the new wine of heaven. The wine of the Holy Spirit. Drink of that wine. Not of the natural like you used to. That doesn't get you anything but in trouble. <laughs> that doesn't cause anything but heartache. You want your heart healed? Drink the new wine. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. When you get drunk in the Holy Ghost, you laugh a lot. Because God is healing. There's healing in the laughter. There's, there's joy. There's gladness. There's abundance. There's fruitfulness. There's fullness. So we can't be afraid of receiving the new thing that God is going to do. That God is doing. Now religious mindset will shut it off. Close the door and say, no, I don't want it. But a mind that has been renewed through the word of God and knows the Holy Spirit. You're saved. You're not unsaved anymore. You've been changed. God's going to do a new thing. And the question is, will you receive it? Will I be open to it? Will I trust the Lord? And all that he's doing. Let me read you another one. 
I like these Old Testament scriptures because they, they speak, they prophetically speak of where we are right now. We're on the threshold. We're at the transition of something greater. And right now, it's a hard time. We, it's a time where we have to live by faith. We are drawing waters out of the well of salvation. Because it's like, man, God, what is going on? It looks like the world is going to hell, and it is. But, you know, that's not our portion. And we are praying and we are asking God to do something greater. To do what he's, to fulfill the fullness of his word in our time, in our day. Because we believe we're living in the last days. Well, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 5, says, Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place. And then a prophecy. About the end time, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. Anybody say amen to that? And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts, this is talking about the mountain of the Lord, Zion, shall make unto all people a feast of fat things. See, it, he's not called us into this fast. He's called us, the last days is about a feasting on his presence. Feasting means drinking the new wine. And to a feast of fat things, a feast of wines, plural, on the less, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. There's a new wine that God has, a new moving, outpouring of the Holy Spirit that doesn't do away with what he's done in the past. What God's about to do through us does not take away from what God did in us. Passover, or what he did in Pentecost, being filled with the Holy Spirit. It builds upon those things. It's the greater thing. It goes from 30, 60 to 100 fold. God's doing something greater. Joel prophesies about the end times. Chapter 3, verse 18 says this in the book of Joel. It shall come to pass in that day. What day? I believe our day in this time. Where things are wrapping up, coming to a conclusion, to a fulfillment, to a culmination. Coming to the end, the maturing of the wheat and the tares. It shall come pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine. Say new wine. And the hills shall flow with milk. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth to the house of the Lord. And shall water the valley of Shittim. Travis would like that. He likes that word. Shit him. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure why he likes it so much. I'm not going to go there. You have to ask him. Let's go to the book of Psalms. One last verse here. Psalms 104. I hope I wrote that down. 104 verse 15. I didn't even check this out, but I think that was the right verse. We'll find out what it says. Maybe it wasn't. I know 104 was right, but I don't know the verse. Oh, there it is, verse 15. That is what I said when it, I don't know why I went to 18. It's verse 15. I said 18, and I actually wrote down 15. So there, that's how my mind works. It says, um, And wine that maketh glad the heart of a man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted. You know, this is speaking about his people, his, rem his end time army, if you will, of believers. It's talking about what God is going to do. And I believe we're in that time when God's going to do it. So let me give you some other, just some pretty cool knowledge facts here about wine in the Bible. I think I've made it very clear that I'm not talking about a natural wine. I've never even... I don't like drinking wine. I never liked the taste of wine. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Okay? I had other drinks of choice, but we won't talk about that either. But in the Bible, when it talks about the word wine in Hebrew, it's the word yayin, or yanyin, yayin. And it means, it, when you look it up, it actually means the fermented, the intoxicating. It's also called the banqueting wine. That's why Jesus created Yahin at the, the marriage supper, at the, the wedding feast in, Gal, in Ga, what was it? Cana of Galilee. 
Okay, it was the intoxicating banqueting wine. It was the best wine. It was the mature wine. It was the oldest of wines. It was a foretaste of what was to come. Okay, yayin, the Hebrew word for wine, has a gematria of a numerical value of the letters. Remember, it's an alphanumeric language, so numbers are important. Wine has a numerical value of 70. Guess what else does? The word mystery in Hebrew. Also, the letter ein, which is the letter, which is a picture of an I. Ein is the I. It also has a numerical value of 70. So these three all have a value of 70, and they're connected. Because supernatural wine, the wine of the Spirit, when you partake of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our understanding so that we can begin to see the mysteries. Begin to perceive what God is doing. That's, you know, discernment. You know you, that you know this is right. And this is what God is doing. So wine opens our eyes to see the mystery of what was hidden before, but now is being revealed. Apocalypto. The end times. What God is doing now. He's taking the lid off. He's removing the cover. It's the word revelation. So we receive revelation when you drink the wine of the Spirit. Your eyes are open. Because, like Paul said, you get beside yourself. You're not thinking in your own logical mind anymore, in the natural. You're moving into the realm of the supernatural. Where you see God doing something brand new. Something that is beyond the natural. Water was what? Ordinary. That wasn't something out of the ordinary to have pots of water or to have water flowing in a river. But God will take the ordinary, just like Jesus, and he'll turn it into extraordinary. The extraordinary, which is the wine. He turns the water, the ordinary, into the extraordinary. When we just give it to him, when we trust him, when we believe in him. So the best wine is yet to come. The new wine is for a mature. It's a mature wine. And it's for the time I believe we're living in right now. It represents transformation. The wine represents his glory. The wine represents his millennial reign. I believe on the earth. This kingdom of God that's coming. The fan is blowing my pages. Okay. Let me look and see if there's anything that I'm missing here. So I'm just going to go real quick through things, through the scriptures that wine represents. Just kind of summarizing it for us. Okay, number one, wine represents the miraculous. Well, let me just start with, preface it with, wine equals Holy Spirit. The moving of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring. So wine represents the miraculous. Wine represents the messianic kingdom. Wine represents joy and gladness. See, God doesn't want us sad. Wine represents fruitfulness and abundance. God wants to bless us. Wine represents maturity. The water into the wine. Wine represents boldness. In Hebrew, there's a word for boldness. Chutzvah. Do you have chutzvah? Are you bold? Do you not take no for an answer? Will you keep, when you know it's God, will you keep pursuing? Will you keep pressing in? Will you, will you refuse to quit? Do you have chutzvah in you? Do you have that boldness, that determination? No matter what, you're going to see it come to pass. Wine represents transformation. The ordinary into the extraordinary. Wine represents the glory. The seventh millennial. From the very beginning, 7,000. We're in the seventh millennial. We're stepping into the new millennial that Jesus talked about that he would pour a new wine into new wineskins. So we have to be renewed. Our minds have to be renewed. We have to prepare to receive the new wine. The wine represents the best is yet to come. It represents maturity in the body of Christ. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let me talk about six real quick. Okay. There was six pots, right? 
120 gallons, 120 in the upper room. Six is the man. Man was created on the sixth day. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. From nine in the morning to three in the afternoon. Six. Man, six in Hebrew, the sixth letter is the Vav. It's the letter of connection. It means connection. So what, what is the six? What was Jesus saying? Jesus was the connection between heaven and earth. The first Adam shut the door. The second or the last Adam, Jesus opened the door. For heaven and earth to once again become one. To, for that connection to be reestablished. The door to be opened. We're six days from creation or we're living, stepping into the fulfillment of 6,000 years and into the seventh day. Which I believe is the millennial day. The millennial kingdom reign. Vav connects heaven and earth. Thank you, Lord. See if there's anything else I want to... Okay, I will, I will throw this in. This is Hebraic. I didn't write all this down, but... Way back in the garden, when sin entered in, what happened? It says that they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And most Christian teachings teach or say that it was an apple. Hebrew, Hebraic thinking is that it, they don't believe it was an apple. They believe it was grapes. That it was the vine. That it was, they partook of... <laughs> They made a covenant through this tree of the knowledge of good and evil by partaking of the vine. And that's why when Noah, he planted a vineyard. Because he had the opportunity to do the right thing. But what did Noah do? Adam and Eve did not do the right thing. They partook, it, wasn't, it wasn't that God was saying that we could never partake of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. The reason God forbid it in Adam and Eve because they were immature. They were created perfect, but they were immature. They did not have life experience yet. They had not walked with the Lord yet. Maturity comes by walking with God. So he forbid them to partake of that because they weren't ready. That took a level of maturity and it was a picture for the church. God hasn't poured out the greatest of all wine the 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 fine wine that takes time the outpouring of the spirit that we're longing for because we haven't been ready we are not mature enough to handle it they weren't mature enough it was a picture for the church i had an encounter you can believe it or not but i i believe it in with adam in the garden of eden i was caught up and taken into the garden i knew where i was and i knew who he was there was this man there and I asked him, why did you do it? He said, I was looking for a shortcut because of my immaturity. He was looking for a shortcut to get to, to, you know. He wanted to be just like his father, which is a good thing. But you have to go through the process. You don't take a three-year-old and give him the responsibilities of a 20-year-old. They're not ready for it. Adam wasn't ready. Eve wasn't ready. But they took of the fruit. The forbidden fruit of the vine is what the Hebrews teach. And so Noah planted a vineyard because he had the opportunity to do the right thing. It was a new beginning, right? Noah represented another, a new beginning in time. All the old had been washed away by the flood. How Noah has a new day in front of him. He, he's at a threshold. He's at a transition place. He plants a vineyard. He can do the right thing. But no, what does he do? He gets drunk in the natural. He takes the vineyard, raises the grapes, crushes the grapes, squeezes it out, ferments it, and then gets drunk. And then bad things happen. Canaan is cursed. The son of Ham. Because he saw Noah's nakedness. I believe is how the story went. So anyway, God is looking for a bride. He's looking for a remnant. He's looking for people that have made themselves ready. That are mature. So how do you mature? Well, you got to drink the wine. You got to drink of the Holy Spirit. The word is not enough. The water is good, but the wine is even better. We need the water and the wine together. That's why Jesus turned the water into the wine. 
And it wasn't a new wine. It was, it was a new wine in time, but it was actually an ancient wine that had been held in reserve in heaven to be poured into the, out into the earth in his time, in the time that we're in right now. There's a, I'm just telling you, there's a new wine. There was a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And are we ready for it? Because it, it matures. It's looking for a mature bride, a mature people. Because it's, it's so great that if we're not mature, we will also misuse it. We will also abuse it. We can also miss the day of our visitation, just like the Jews did when Jesus showed up. So let's be open. Let's prepare. Something greater is happening. Don't lose hope. Expect the unexpected. We've got to get our expectant, expectors turned back on. It's not going to just be the same old, same old. Jesus said he was coming, and he is. Jesus said he's going to do this, and he is. Every knee will bow. Every time we'll confess, all the altars of Baal will be destroyed. All the altars of Ashtaroth and Jezebel, all the works of evil, will be exposed and destroyed. He's not going to leave us the way that we are. He's coming back for people who are prepared who are matured, who are ready to handle the most potent of all wine, the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of all time. Is that going to be you and I? I want to get ready. I, I need to be drinking in secret. <laughs> I need to be drinking from the Holy Spirit, drinking in the new wine because it's changing us. It's transforming us. It's maturing us. It's teaching us his ways. It, it's revealing the mysteries and all the, the knowledge and revelation that has been hidden, not from us, but for us. A move of God, not hidden from us, but for us. Now's the time for the outpouring of the new wine. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. So let's pray. And I'll just make this stuff up. I, I truly believe that the Lord spoke to me to speak this into this church, even though there's just five of us, to speak this word. This is important. So I, you speak as the oracles of God. You speak by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is saying there is a greater, there's a finer wine. There is a wine and it'll, it'll appear as a new wine, but it's actually an ancient wine. That's been from the very beginning. Because the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. Blood equals wine. His blood. The new wine of the New Testament. The finality. The fullness. The culmination. The fulfilling of everything. In our time. So Father... Help each one of us not to lose hope. Help us, Lord, not to get weary in well-doing. Help us, Lord, to be open to what you want to do and the way that you want to do it. That we won't hold on to the old, that we won't be like an old wineskin, but we'll allow Holy Spirit to change us to prepare us, to renew us, transform us, create a new, th something brand new in us, that we would be that new wineskin ready to receive the new wine of heaven into these earthen vessels, to demonstrate the kingdom in a way that has never been demonstrated before, Lord, to do the works of Jesus and greater works, to see the full manifestation of the power of heaven on earth. To see your Holy Spirit create a new thing. A new heaven, a new earth. A new day. A new people. A new kingdom. Which is an ancient kingdom. Thank you, Lord. That you give us understanding. Prepare ourselves. You got to prepare, but you also have to position to receive the outpouring. 
you got to get into the spout of where he's pouring it out. Get in your place. Find your place in the body. Stay there because there's an outpouring coming. If you're not there, the wine's going to be poured out and you're, you're not going to receive it. It's not going to do you any good. Don't be the old wineskin. Don't be so religious. You can be right, but don't be dead right. There's life in the blood. There's life in the new wine. Father, help us to be ready. Help me to have my heart ready. To be ready to receive the greater things. The greater things than these shall we also do. That will be purified and let the Holy Spirit fill us and move through us unhindered without limitation. That's what I pray, Lord. That's my hope in my heart. That's why we've labored, Lord. That's why we've served you for all these years. Because you put a hope in our heart that there's something greater. That things are not going to stay the same. That they're going to be transformed. That your kingdom is going to come. That you, Messiah, are going to be in your kingdom. And you're going to rule and reign on earth as you are in heaven. We thank you for all of this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.